Praise the Lord. Just as pastor has mentioned, uh, uh, it was a, a, a big struggle for me to get here, but I thank God that I'm finally here. Uh, I spent a few days in, C, uh, in uh, Caris, uh, and, and we've had a wonderful time there. But I want to bring greetings from my dear wife, Margaret, whom you know, she's been here. She asked me to greet you. I also bring greetings from uh, the church, Grace Assembly. You've been a great blessing to us. When I first came here 10 years ago, 2010, I think, was the first time, uh, God connected me with Pastor Mark, and if you met us 20, 30 minutes later, you'd have thought that we had been together for three years. There was a connection in our hearts just happened like that. And from that moment, uh, CFAN has been a great blessing to us. In fact, one of the major uh, things that Pastor and this church, CFAN, you did was you bought us a big truck and a big tent. And we've been going around the country using this truck and this tent to disciple Uganda, as I will be sharing later on. So we owe a lot of our prayers to you. You are always in our prayers. Pastor Mark and Pastor Linda, you are always in our prayers, and you've visited us at least three times. And we uh, don't take that for granted. When I first shared here with Pastor Mark about the vision to disciple the nation, uh, he was like, was the first one to embrace this. I had been to Chicago, uh, Bill Hybels Church, and many other churches in the US and Europe and Asia and Africa, and nobody seemed to really embrace this message. I'm going to kind of in, uh, uh, summarize a few of the points, but I was surprised that Pastor Mark, you picked it right then, and, uh, and you said, we want to run with this. And I used to tell him every time we would meet, I said, it is much easier here because you have a very rich godly heritage in America because of your founding fathers. For us in Africa, we have had centuries and centuries of witchcraft and idolatry. So for us, it's a, we are breaking a new ground. For you to take your nation, it's just uh, like uh, uh, um, Isaac. Isaac, you remember that I wanted a verse which you may know. I'm going to, to read it later on. This verse in uh, uh, Genesis 26, verse 18, which says that Isaac had to under and dig the wells that his father, Abraham, had dug. You remember the Philistines went and covered them. It's Genesis 26, 18. That all he did was just to release these wells afresh. That's what it is here in America. You already have the wells dug by your founding fathers. The spirit of the Philistines has come through the years, especially the last 150 years, clog them up. All you have to do is to release these wells afresh. Praise the Lord. You should say amen for that. Now, allow me to share a few things about the Great Commission, and I will ask uh, that you put my slides here. I always use PowerPoints because Jesus used PowerPoints in form of parables because he knew people needed <laughs> So, and also, Pastor Mark always tells me, you know your accent. So the problem is not you, the problem is me because my accent seems to be a little bit different. And David keeps reminding me of that, that as much as possible, put something there so that we can, uh, I pronounce some words differently. So it may take you a little bit of time, but when I put it here, it makes it very easy. And I'll ask you to join me in some of these verses so that we read them together. I want to give it a scripture background and then I'll share with you what we are doing in Uganda in line and in regard to that. Can we start with Genesis 1:26? One, one, two, three, go. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth. This is God's idea about man and it has never changed. Very important. To me, when I discovered that, God even knew about the fall, he knew about what would happen, but he still went ahead and created man in his image and said, he shall have dominion. That's why you are here. Can you kindly tell your neighbor politely that you are here to exercise dominion? You are here to exercise dominion. 
That is the purpose for which you are created. All other things follow, but that's why you are here. God's attitude and mind about you is that you would exercise dominion over all the earth. That is the first verse. Number two, in verse, in Psalms 115, verse 16, can we read it together? The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. Now we are going to read it again, but you put your name there. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to Joshua. Are you bold enough to put your name there? Let's read it again. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth, he has given it to Joshua. Hallelujah. Yeah. So when he thinks about Colorado, he has given it to you. Whichever village or uh, community you are, that's, without you, he would not do anything. He has power to do it, but he decided not to do anything because he has handed the earth to man. That's why we have to pray. The reason we have to pray is not because God doesn't know. Yeah. No, he'll wait for us to ask him to intervene. Spirits are not allowed to operate here. That's why even Jesus had to come in human flesh. Because spirits, angels can only be sent here, go back. They are not allowed to operate on earth. The only person who has authority to operate on earth is man and you. So whatever God has to do here in Colorado, in the U.S., Man has to be involved. If we don't do anything, he won't. He used to tell Israel, I have all these wonderful plans, but I'll wait for you. You'll go and pray and seek me and seek me and seek me and find me. If you seek me with all your heart, and then I'll do whatever I say. I'll wait for you to be inquired of you. I'll wait. I'll wait until you inquire of me to do all those wonderful things I've said. That's what the scripture says in Ezekiel. Because God has handed the earth, its responsibility, its well-being in the hands of man. And that man is you. Let's look at what happened. Uh, we know all of us know that at the fall, this was affected. God lost two things. He lost the man and the authority that he had vested in man. Two things that God lost. He lost the man and the authority that he had vested in man. And that is the light in which we should see the Great Commission. We should see the Great Commission in those two losses that took place in Genesis. Yes. He lost the man, and the authority in the spirit realm is something very tangible, you can touch it like this. So it is those two losses that Jesus had to come to handle. And that's why I want to read this verse. In Mark 16, verse uh, 15 and 16, he handles one loss, and then Matthew handles the second loss. Let's start with the first loss. Can we read it together? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In the Mark gospel, you know the four gospel writers each emphasizes an aspect of Jesus. Matthew presents Jesus as king. Mark presents him as a servant. Luke presents him as a, a man. John presents Jesus as God. Mark is emphasizing the individual salvation. That's why he says, eh? preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes. So he emphasizes the individual. Mark emphasizes the individual. How about Matthew? Let's look at Matthew. What does Matthew emphasize? Matthew presents Jesus as king and emphasizes the kingdom which God lost. God lost the man and he lost the kingdom that he had vested in man. So those two things is what the devil took. So Jesus comes to get the man and the authority that had been vested in man. Let's read uh, uh, this passage. And Jesus came to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching whatsoever I commanded you. Now, we, we have the go in Mark. Mark starts with go, and also Matthew starts with go. Notice the difference. 
in Matthew, he says, go ye therefore. Why is that therefore, therefore? <laughs> why, why is the therefore there? Why does he say, go ye therefore? Because of every time you start with the, a sentence with therefore, you have to go back. So when you go back to this previous verse 18, what is it that is referring to? Authority. Because that's what we lost in Genesis. Why do we go? Because he has gotten back what we lost. We lost authority. We lost our rulership. Jesus has come and restored it by his obedience. He has gotten back all that we lost as human beings to rule. So he's saying, now that I have it all, go ye therefore. The therefore is referring to all authority. Notice that all authority, not some authority, not much authority, not most authority, but all authority. So he has it all in heaven and here on earth and says, go get these nations back. Get them all. Not just individuals as Mark has said, but get the nations. Get America, get Britain, get Germany, get Mexico, get all of them. Because now I have it all. Praise the Lord. I've gotten it back. I've restored you, the authority that you lost. So go therefore. Now, the summary here, you notice that in this passage, he says, you do that by teaching whatsoever I commanded you. And I'm going to say something about that. So let's summarize it. In Mark, he says, go preach to individuals. In Matthew, he says, go teach nations. That's the way. We, he has a plan for both. God expects us to complete both aspects of the Great Commission. This is what he says, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony or for a demonstration to all nations. It's until then that the end will come. Notice that Jesus desires that every individual is redeemed and every society is transformed and nations are discipled by this gospel of the kingdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. Every time the gospel is mentioned in the New Testament, it's called the gospel of the kingdom. It's not called the gospel of salvation. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. That's what God lost. Now, because human beings, we emphasize our side we always talk about salvation. But that's not the purpose we were created. You were not created to be saved. No, that's not why you were created. Did God say, let us make man so that he may be saved? Is that what he said? What did he say? Let us make man in our image so that he may rule. You were created to rule, but while you were going to rule, you had an accident, and so you could not continue. So God had to bring, a, uh, you call it a, a, a service, what do you call it, breakdown service? Here, what do you call it? When uh, you have a breakdown of your car and then you, ha you have to call, eh? a what? Uh -huh. That is what we call it. In Uganda, we call it breakdown service. When your car breaks down on the road, you call for the breakdown, they come and toll. Uh -huh. So salvation is a breakdown service. I'm sorry to mention, but that's exactly what it is. That's not the purpose for which we are created. We cannot make that the end. No. That is the breakdown service. We are here going to Denver. We have a breakdown on the way. Uh, the vehicle can't move, so we get a service too. But after that, we don't camp there. And you say, eh, Castle Rock, is that one of the places? Castle Rock, pastor has taken me to Castle Rock. So we, you get a breakdown at Castle Rock. And then you come at Castle Rock, you get chicken. I like a chick fil uh, I don't know what you like. <laughs> but the whole day you are there feasting. Eh? Suppose you had a terrible breakdown and the vehicle had a terrible accident and everybody comes and says, ah! you mean did anybody survive this accident? People say, yes, there are people here in, in the restaurant here. You survived that? Eh? You need chicken, get some more chicken. <laughs> get and then you feast the whole day, the next day, the third day, the fourth day, the whole week, the whole month, the whole year. You're just feasting that you survived this terrible accident. We're able to survive. So we camp there 
praising God for having, what should we do? Shouldn't we continue where we were going? Shouldn't we continue where we were going? Should we camp at Castle Rock and spend all our days thanking God that we survived the accident? That's what we do in church. So everybody comes and congratulates. You also survived the accident? Praise the Lord. Get a piece of chicken. You survived that. Get a hamburger. Hey, you also survived? Get. So you camp there. Then very soon you have misunderstanding. Then you have separate tents and restaurants. Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Pentecostal. So we camp at Castle Rock instead of continuing to Denver. That's what we've done. The purpose for which we were created was not salvation. No. Salvation handles the first loss. But we have to go back and fulfill the second loss, which God... That's why when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? Pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yes. Thy kingdom come. That's what he lost. Yes. And when he's ending, say, for thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. So we have to go to Denver. We have to continue. Can you kindly tell your neighbor we need to move from Castle Rock and continue to Denver? Where we are going, we cannot continue camping at Castle Rock, feasting. You also got saved? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you still saved? Yes, hallelujah. Get a hamburger. Get Chick-fil-A. And we, we continue in Castle Rock. So while the world continues, while America goes down, while everybody takes over? No, 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 no. So the former, notice that to save the individuals is very urgent because the people have a limited lifespan. So every generation has a responsibility to ensure that all the people living at that time are saved. So that is urgent. That is urgent. We need to preach the gospel. And America has done a great, because you've sent 94% of all the missionaries all over the world. The rest of us, the remaining nations, only contribute 6%. So America, you've done a great job. I think you need to clap for yourselves for that particular part on the individual. We, many of us, got saved because of your... Yeah, yeah, I got saved. An American expatriate led me to Christ. Yes, so you've done a wonderful, and we owe a lot to America because of that, the first part of preaching the gospel to every individual. But the latter, which is the nations, requires us to set multi-generational strategies which will transform communities, disciple whole nations into sheep nations. Now, this second part is not common. This second part is not emphasized. We emphasize the first one because from, uh, from the human point of view, we are looking at our benefit. We want to get saved because we don't go, want to go to hell. But how about God's benefit? How about God, who initially wanted a kingdom? He wanted to send his kingdom from planet heaven to planet earth. How about his interests? His interests are the nations. Saving individuals is a means to an end. It's not an end. It's a means to an end to get him what he lost. Now, so I put it this way. The individual is a monogenerational agent uh, assignment. But for nations, you need multi-generational strategies. And it is strategic. You have to be strategic. You, you have to plan multi-generationally. That's what your founding fathers did. They did a wonderful work on number two. 150 years ago, that was lost. But their focus was, we need to have the whole nation, its politics, its education, its agriculture, its everything, arts and entertainment. That's how they used to think about the gospel. They started 108 institutions, starting with Harvard in 1636, a year in 1701, and a hundred, total 108 institutions. Their intention was a nation that is fully educated and discipled in the word of God. That is what has brought all these blessings, which has made this nation great, and all of us have shared on that, that blessing. Why? Because their focus was this. 
they were strategic. The, 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 the pilgrims said, even if we are just a stepping stone, I like that. Because they saw that what they are sowing will take long. They had seen what was in Europe, the mess there, the uh, religious tension and fights. And, and then they said, for us, we're going to start another nation where there will be freedom, where people will be educated, and then we will take the gospel over the world. Look at that. That is the strategic, multi-generational approach to the gospel. Did they achieve? Yes. This is the blessing that you today enjoy because their focus was that. 150 years ago, all that changed after the Civil War. Now, I'm not going to that because I know many of you know that. But God's plan is to save individuals, to save families, to save institutions, cities, and nations. And I've summarized this this way. How do we move from the individual to the nation? Mark, on one side, is an individual. Matthew, on the other side, is nations. And I put the Greek words, don't be bothered by the Greek words, but they bring out a very, very important aspect. The individual is anthropos in, in Greek, while ethnos is the nation. Go ye therefore and make disciples of ethnos. In between, there are three other entities to bridge the two gaps. How do I move from an individual? When an individual is saved, God wants that individual to go beyond personal blessing. He wants this individual to see the bigger picture. Paul said to the Philippian jailer, you will be saved and your household. The word used there is oikos. You shall be saved and your oikos, your whole household. Does God want households to be saved? Yes. He said one time, I cannot hide what I'm going to do. I can't hide it to Abraham. Why? Because he will command his children and household after him to follow the way of the Lord. God expects every man to command his households to follow the way of the Lord. So God expects our salvation to go beyond the individual salvation, to go beyond the individual blessing, to the family blessing, to the family benefit, and not only that, to go beyond that. We see in the, the New Testament, another word is used, koinonos. Koinonos, today we understand it as fellowship. But in the biblical times when it was used, it went beyond just the fellowship of meeting together. It talked about the systems, all the systems around institutions. That's what koinonos meant, but it was brought into the church and used to be, look at what Jesus said about his church. He said, I'll build my ecclesia. Ecclesia is a company of people that have been called out to exercise uh, rulership, to legislate on behalf of the city. That's how ecclesia was used. It wasn't a religious word. It was a political word because Jesus had come to establish a kingdom. And he said, I am going to establish my own ecclesia to legislate on, king, on, on, on heaven's behalf here. So he has a ecclesia in Colorado so that when that ecclesia meets, they will legislate and ensure that kingdom interests are met in Colorado. That's what ecclesia is. Now, there are two words in the New Testament. One is ecclesia, which talks about this legislative assembly, which is political. And then there is a meeting for fellowship, a synagogue in Hebrews 10, 25. Don't stop meeting together for fellowship. That one is a synagogue. Ep synagogue, don't stop assembling together as many do. So continue to ep synagogue. But don't forget your ecclesia assignment. Now, most of what we've done as church is that we ep synagogue, we, forgive, we forget to ecclesia. Now ask your neighbor, what do you do most? Ecclesia or ep synagogue? What do you, that is the key, what we are, I'm talking about today. Our responsibility to disciple the city and the nation is our ecclesia assignment. Most of us see our responsibility as only a synagogue. As long as we meet together, I'm faithful in this church because even the pastor knows I a synagogue. No, we have to concentrate on both. We have to do both. Look at the third 
word there is polis. Polis is the city. City is where we get the word, uh, uh, let me put this here. City is where we get the word citizen. In the biblical times, polis was the word. Jesus went to every city, every polis. Decapolis were the 10 cities beyond the Jordan. He went to every city preaching. Jesus had a, mes a, a, a message for cities as well as individuals. He preached to Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, said, woe unto you, the message that I preached in you, the miracles I performed in you, if I had performed them in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would be here today. Jesus had a message for a city. If he lived it today, he would have a message for Colorado, he would have a message for Denver, he would have a message for uh, Washington, D.C. He would, he would be preaching to the cities. We preach to ourselves, we encourage ourselves, which is good, because that's the beginning, but it must not be the end. That's word police is where we get the word police, the protectors of the city. Politicians, the leaders of the city. Policy, the rules of the city. This is part of the system to move from the individual to the nation. God wants us to move from the individual salvation, from the individual benefit to the nation. You have to take your salvation beyond your interests. Lord bless me and my wife, our son Tom, and had asked for no more. Amen. That kind of prayer is so selfish. Because all your focus is personal blessing and our immediate family. That is not God. God is a very generous God. Why does he perform miracles for us? Because when we see his power, he wants us to take it to others. That's what he told Israel. You've limited me. I wanted to show the nations my goodness, but you've retained all the blessings to yourselves. And all the Gentiles are now being what? Yeah? My names are blasphemed in the nations because you've not demonstrated to them. We've enjoyed the Lord. We've found his salvation and benefits, but we've kept it to ourselves. How can a city benefit? How can a nation benefit from our salvation when we have so many Christians in America? How can we allow it to go down when we have that power of the Holy Spirit? The same power he uses to save an individual is the same power he uses to save a city. He doesn't even need to gnash his teeth. That now this city is so difficult. No! Just like that, he heals the city. He heals the nation. His power is unlimited. It is we who limit him because we can only see my needs, my problems, my challenges, and all my prayers are those. If I can stretch my faith, then the same power he used to heal you, to save you, to deliver you, is the power he used to save the city. Praise the Lord. He has power to save a city. He has power to save a nation. That's what your founding fathers understood. They knew it. They believed it. They practiced it. We have learned a lot. I, I am a student of American history, and I cannot help but marvel at the revelation that God gave them. How, how they said that the world is much better because of those few people, your fathers. That's why I said you have a great heritage upon which you are going to build and save America. Yeah. All of us can struggle. For you, it's very, very easy. It only needs people to just wake up and do it. That is the difference. Now, let me end this with this sermon. We need to move people from the convert to disciple to minister. Each person, a believer here, must go back and make sure your salvation is felt in your house, your whole family, your extended family. It's a responsibility. It's an assignment. It's not an option. You shall be saved and your household. The, the, the second level is that when, when you are involving your whole community, you are asking God, how do I impact my community here? Now that I am here, I'm your ambassador in this in this place. God will only work according to what you see. He does not force you. No. What you believe him to do, he will do. If you can believe him for a village, he will save a village. If you can believe him for a city, he will save a city. I personally, in the last 20 years, I've believed that a nation can be saved. And I've seen what God has done. Amen. Pastor Mark has really come there and witnessed some of the things that God is doing at unbelievable. And we thank God for that friendship and support and prayer. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that all that we enjoy and the blessings, 
You know, he bought me a very big SUV. I can drive all over the nation as a bishop. Hallelujah. So <laughs> they, they, he came and said, Bishop, this vehicle is not very good. I want to get you a very big one. So I sit there at the back and they drive me. The bishop has arrived. So the mayors and what? In the last few weeks, I was dedicating all the cities. The parliament uh, designated 10 new cities. So I went and dedicated them for two months, from October 28th to December 24th. I was dedicating these cities. We, we drove with the truck and the tent. I would call all the newly elected leaders, the councillors on every level. We would have about 2,000 people and dedicate these new cities. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And I would teach the principles of God's kingdom and they were all excited. I told them we are going to build a city on godliness. Those cities are now going to be different. Because I told them we are going to denounce the idolatry your fathers have practiced. Your ancestors have been, and they all listened. And they said we will need God's blessing. And then we would stand and pray for about two hours. And by the time we finished, you could see the joy of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? God bless you.